Hello and welcome to the Pastor Well Podcast. This is Herschel York, the Dean of the School of Theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm also pastor of the Buck Run Baptist Church in Frankfurt. And the Pastor Well Podcast is a podcast dedicated to helping those who serve the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ be faithful in their ministry. And today we are especially privileged to have uh, Dr. Tom Schreiner with us, and we're going to be talking about preaching and theology with one of the eminent New Testament scholars of our time. Dr. Schreiner is the James Buchanan Harrison Professor of New Testament Interpretation at Southern Seminary, the author of many books. Uh, we will talk about that momentarily. Uh, he has also served as the teaching pastor at the Clifton Baptist Church in Louisville. He's still an elder there, but no longer the teaching pastor, and uh, is a tremendous uh, professor in the classroom, a great preacher, a dear friend of mine. We came on the faculty of Southern Seminary together in 1997, so we have a, a lengthy friendship, and we have served as colleagues. Dr. Schreiner, welcome to Pastor Well. Oh, thanks. Dr. York, it's great to be with you. Uh, well, I'm I'm just delighted to have you here today and just want to ask you some questions. We want to talk about uh, theology and preaching, but I, I want to hear about you first. I want our listeners to get to know you a bit. So uh, very briefly, tell us how you came to know the Lord and then really how you felt called into the ministry. Yeah, I, I grew up in a Catholic family. I'm uh, the sixth of eight children. Uh, I, when I came into my teenage years, I wasn't even going to church anymore, at least if I could get away with it. But then I met uh, this girl. Uh, we started dating. She was a very young Christian. She told me about Jesus. She gave me a Bible. She invited me to her house. And one thing led to another. I started reading the Bible, the New Testament, really, for the first time. And in 45 days, uh, I became a believer. And that person is now my wife, Diane. Wow. And um, I, I wouldn't say that the moment I was saved, I knew I was called to ministry. But the next time I thought of it, the next time it entered my mind, what am I going to do with my life, I knew I knew beyond all doubt I'm, I'm called to the ministry. That, just that, that soon? That soon. It, it was just what you wanted to do? Yeah. It, it was, and and yeah. I, was, I was the end of my junior year in high school, and in my senior year, I wrote the seminary. I ended up going to Portland Sem, uh, Western Seminary in Portland, and I said to them, what, what should I major in if I'm going to go to seminary? And they told me to major in English literature. And so with a degree in English literature, you ended up at Western Seminary. Yeah, yeah. And all right, uh, so you came to know the Lord really through personal witness and testimony and the power of the New Testament applied by the Holy Spirit. Tell me about preaching, though. Uh, so who? tell me about the first time you heard someone preach the gospel. Do you remember it? Like, was, was that... Uh, significant to you? I know it, Diane's emphasis, uh, uh, her influence was what was really used to the Lord to bring you to him, but was there a, a local church that she was a part of that you then, is that where you went? Yeah, it was a conservative Baptist church in uh, Salem, Oregon, but I'd actually say the first time I heard the gospel preached powerfully was on TV. Huh. I, I heard Billy Graham. And, all, and, and also, up in Portland, I heard uh, Luis Palau. And, and I heard both of them preach the gospel in, uh, on, on, on the television. And it, it struck me very powerfully. I watched Billy Graham a lot of times. Really? Yeah. Was, now, that was, was before or after you trusted the Lord? No, it was after. after. I, I'd, I'd heard of him before, but I'd never watched him. Uh, but then you became interested in... In, in hearing preaching. Yeah. All right, let's fast forward to the first time you preached. Do you remember it? That's a good question. When's the first time I preached in a church? I immediately started teaching. Well, one year after I became a Christian, I started teaching the high school kids every every Sunday morning. 
So, so I, you were, they were your peers. You were in, still in high school. Uh, well, no, I was one year ahead. I was oh, in college. Okay. So, I, so I started teaching them. But probably, probably the first time I preached was when I was in seminary because we went to a big church, the, the conservative Baptist church we went to. Both churches I went to were about 1,000. So they wouldn't give me an opportunity to preach. So probably the first time I preached was in a, um, sort of a rescue mission. Great. Yeah. But it's not like it's emblazoned on my mind. Really? You don't remember what you preached? No, I don't. So when oh. did you first get an opportunity then to preach on a regular basis? Do you remember that? I didn't get an opportunity on a regular basis until I'd finished my doctoral work. So, really? Yeah. So I was 29 when I finished. And uh, we joined a church plant, and it was a small church, and I was able to preach once a month at that church. Okay, so you— at But, that but point, it didn't feel different to me because I'd done so much teaching. Teaching. So when, I'd got, when I preached, it didn't feel like, oh, this is dramatically new. Is that reflected in your style to this day? I, th you, I think so. Do, do you make a distinction in teaching and preaching? I do. What is it? I think teaching focuses—I'd say it's a matter of focus— Teaching focuses more on explanation, and of course, there's explanation in preaching, but I think in preaching there's more exhortation than there is typically in teaching. You, so, so I think they overlap, they but, I think, they but I think in preaching there's, uh, I think a person who has a gift of preaching, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, has a gift of teaching and a gift of exhortation combined, and the better preacher you are, the better you are at both. Right. So some preachers are, they're good at teaching, but weaker on exhortation or vice versa. But the best preachers, they're, they're good at both. How do you see yourself? I think I'm stronger on explanation and a little weaker on exhortation. So I've, I've, I've always worked harder, tried to work harder on exhortation because, because I think given what I do, I love, I love explanation. You do, but you also really have the heart of a pastor, wouldn't you say? I think so, yeah. yeah. And how many years did you were you the teaching pastor at Clifton? Well, if you count, so we, we, it began with a church plant in 1998. I joined it in 1998, and then I continued at Clifton through 2015, so that was 17 years. 17 years. Yeah. All right, let me, let me ask you about the way you prepare for a sermon. So do you have a routine for study? And I'm talking specifically of preaching, or, or maybe you don't make a distinction. Maybe you just have a certain amount and a certain way you study uh, for both, like writing commentaries and preaching. But is it what's your study for preaching like? You know, it, it's hard to describe because for any, any New Testament book I preached, I basically already taught it. Right. as an individual course. So th that was helpful because I was busy. So I'd done a lot of the exegesis. I suppose the Old Testament books are the best example because I hadn't spent as much time on those. And, and there I would focus on, I'd read through the whole book. And honestly, what I do is I prepare, I would just read the passage many times over and over and over. Yeah, I do that. I so, do that. Do you... Yeah. In preaching, did you have to force yourself to go to the Old Testament? Uh, so how do you choose text? Did you alternate between old and new law and gospel? Tell me your thought process for how you did that. Yeah, I typically alternated. I thought just I want to keep in both Testaments, so I do typically I do a New Testament book, then an Old Testament. And changing the lens. And, and uh, mm -hmm. how about the the depth of, of your preaching? In other words, uh, did you sometimes like uh, change the pace where I'm going to take large blocks of Scripture and not go as much in detail, look more at the big picture of this and sort of like a, uh, an overview and others, okay, I'm going to use a magnifying glass and go in deeper. Do you change it up or do you have the same pace through any book? No, yeah, I would change it up. I did uh, six sermons one time, uh, one, Genesis 1 through 11, Genesis 12 through 50, then another sermon on Exodus, next sermon on Leviticus, next sermon on Numbers, next sermon on Deuteronomy. I didn't usually do that, but sometimes I would take big sections. But typically, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take such a big... Would you still call that expository? Absolutely. To explain. 
because I would explain what the book was about. I would explain the you know the big picture of the book, and then I'd apply it to the reader. So yeah. I I totally felt it was expository. Do you have a definition of expository preaching? I think expository teaching is unpacking the meaning of the text and applying it to the listeners. Okay, you you you've almost lifted that directly out of my book. I'm just saying <laughs> it's plagiarism. Yeah, it's, I'm not accusing you of that. What I am saying is that we agree. I see long, complicated definitions of expository preaching all the time that I, I think are incorrect because if if you put something in the definition and you remove any element of the definition, then it's no longer the thing you've defined. Yeah, yeah. And what you just said is, to me, the, the synchronon of expository yeah. preaching. It's explaining the meaning, and, and I, I do say that's authorial intent. And making appropriate application, or exhortation, yeah. as you say. And yeah. that's what ex- expository preaching is. So if you're looking at a large chunk of Scripture, Genesis 1 through 11, or you're taking a year to go through Genesis 1 through 11, both are expository. You're yeah. just giving it a, a different a different view. So, Yeah, uh, I totally agree. Well, yeah. I'm so glad you agree with me, Dr. <laughs> Schreiner. Uh, so when do you normally study for preaching? You know, when I started, I would write my sermons on Friday and Saturday, but maybe three or four years in, I don't remember now, I started writing, and I manuscript, I'd write my sermons on Monday, and I really got to like this pattern. I'd be, be, with my teaching schedule, I teach Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So I'd, I'd write out a manuscript on Monday. The reason I would do a manuscript, I don't think you have to do a manuscript, but for me, I knew how long it would take me. That's the main reason I did a manuscript, because I, you, know, you can just go on forever. And I needed, not everyone needs this discipline, but I needed it. I needed to know, okay, how much can I say? And then I could ad lib and so forth and so on. And then Friday and Saturday, I would pray and go over it, make changes, scratch things out. Yeah, often, if it's nice out, I would take walks and pray and meditate over my, my sermon. Do you take the manuscript with you into the pulpit? Yes. Do you read it? No. But I, I know it really well. Uh, usually, yeah. usually by the time I give the sermon, I've gone over it. Well, it depends. Usually it would be 10 to 15 times. So I knew it really well. Do you think it's wrong for a preacher to practice his sermon? No, I don't. But I did not do that. And, and, but I think it might have helped me. But, but honestly, <laughs> honestly, the reason I didn't do it is I'd get bored. I'd get bored with my own sermon if I yeah. said it out loud. So I would just say By the it time and, you delivered it or as you're practicing? As I'm practicing. Oh, interesting. And, and, and for me, a, a big part of the sermon is being excited about what I'm about to say. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. How long are your sermons usually? Uh, they were typically, I think at the beginning, they were maybe 30 minutes at the end, maybe 35 to 40. But they're on the shorter end, at least according to what some people do. Yeah, I'm hoping people at Buck Run aren't listening to that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, so let me ask you a question. Uh how do you think the structure of the text affects the structure of the sermon? Now, I'm going to press you a little bit because you, you, you said that you believe a big overview sermon like that can still be expository. So does the structure of the text affect the structure of the way you present it in the sermon? I would say not necessarily. It depends. I, I don't think there's any rule here. I think sometimes... The structure of the text unfolds in such a way that that's the way you want to preach it. I think it's one thing to understand the structure of the text, right. to trace out the structure of the text, to understand how the text is put together. But for, I'm not thinking of an example off the top of my head, but for various homiletical reasons, you may preach it very differently from the structure and it'd be faithful and uh, powerful. And, and used in remarkable ways. I I think you preach that way uh, at times when I've heard you. I'm not very creative, but I've heard creative preachers do that, and I think it's been great. Yeah. So so I, I I'm hesitant to say oh here's a rule. I agree. Uh, that this is how it has to be done. Right, mm. and that is why I do not put that in my definition of expository mm. preaching, and 
uh, uh, nor do you, as is obvious. Hey, do you have a sugar stick sermon? You know what that is? A sugar stick is the sermon that preachers always have in their hip pocket if called upon at the last minute, uh, sort of a go-to sermon, or you're asked to preach somewhere, and you don't have a lot of time to prepare anything extra, yet you've accepted this engagement. Uh, do you have one? Um, and I think this would be true of you as well, Herschel. I think we have a lot of sermons, but I think the one I choose first is Romans 3, chapter 3, verses 21 through 26, because I love that text. It's about the gospel, and it's about our uh, trusting in Jesus. So, yeah, I preach that many times when people say, preach whatever you want. I, I, I love that text. I love that text, too. Mm. Uh, yeah, mine I, I used to be mm. Philippians 1.12. Mm. Uh, mm. The things that have happened to me have happened for the furtherance of the gospel, so that mm. my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the praetorium and in all other places. I think in recent years it's become uh, 2 Corinthians 12. Uh, mm. Paul's, uh, the, it, you know, let me digress for a moment and say that 2 Corinthians 12, people miss how that is the really the peroration of Paul's argument on the heels of 10 and 11, where he's been talk, comparing himself to those false mm -hmm. teachers and saying, well, he's like comparing, the, putting the resume up on the table. And then he gets to 12. He says, I'm, I'm going to go on boasting. I must go on boasting. Let's, I'm going to come down to visions and revelations of the Lord. And just when you think uh, that, He's going to say, there, can they match that? Have they ever been caught up to the third heaven? He totally brushes it aside mm. and says, I want to talk about what happened afterwards. I love that text. So see right there, I pulled out my sugar stick yeah. and preached it to you right, uh, r right on, on the, the podcast. Well, that's a great text. It is a great text. Yeah. Do you have a voice in your head, somebody that you, as you prepare a sermon, someone that you hear saying, like MacArthur talks about a professor of his that it was that told him don't miss the point, and as he prepares a sermon, he always hears this guy saying you know don't miss the point. I've had students that I had a preaching class tell me that I'm the voice in their head, mm. uh, and I think I hear Adrian Rogers had a profound impact on me and my preaching. Do you, is there anybody like that? I w I wouldn't say that. I think when I'm preaching a sermon, I'm always saying to myself. Is it, is it clear? Is it, I mean, that's the voice in my head. Is it clear? Is it applicable? Have I made it, have I made it too complex? Am I, am I, so the, the, it's not any particular person. Well, that, that we all hear, hear something. Something's looping up there as we, as we prepare. Uh, to what extent do you pray as you, as you prepare? You were talking about walking along and, yeah. Uh, tell me about that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a huge part of the sermon. I mean, I pray as I, not just when I was walking, but I'd pray over what I wrote. I, Lord, help me to, help me to be faithful to what's there. Help me to write and say what's helpful to your people. Uh, Lord, uh, make my heart uh, excited about this. I mean, I think that's a huge part of preaching. And uh, that didn't always happen, right? I mean, most of the time it did, but I think there were times that I wasn't spiritually engaged. And I think that happens through prayer. Yeah. And, and, and then to pray for the people. Pray for the saints to be, I'd often pray for the saints to be encouraged or convicted, and for unbelievers. Yeah, and uh, almost every time I'd say I'd weave in the gospel in some way because it just struck me. There's yeah. always an unbeliever. You, you there. don't know who's there. Yeah. That's exactly right. Uh, do do you and your wife Diane ever discuss your preaching after it's preached? Does she give you your, her opinion on your sermon? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Diane's very. I mean, she's very loving, very kind, very affirming, but she's also honest. And uh, forthright in her personality, she's. Um, our, I, our wives share that. I I said I'd like to marry a spicy wife in a good sense. You know, she's she's got her own personality. So yeah, she'll she'll tell me, she'll say to me, we don't always agree. She'll say I don't agree with that point even. You know, I think you missed that, or and I'll say whatever, <laughs> and. Uh, so, and she'll say sometimes, yeah, that sermon, it just seemed like 
it wasn't as effective. I mean, she's, you know, really kind. I, I don't think I ever felt discouraged by her. There would, you know, what I actually remember more, though, is um, I would say to her, maybe when I felt um, discouraged, I mean, it would almost happen both ways. I'd say to her, I just felt like that sermon didn't go well. And she'd often say to me, I don't agree. I thought it went great. And I'd say, oh, and then, or another Sunday, I'd say, I felt it went particularly well. Now, don't overread this. No, I and, understand. But she'd say, uh, I didn't really notice any difference. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that helped me to realize, you know, my own subjective feelings. You're, that you, not, are, you are not an mm-hmm. accurate gauge of your own preaching sometimes. Right. I mean, I've had both of those experiences that you just described. I think any preacher who's married, and has been preaching long, has had both those things happen. Yeah. Uh, my wife, Tanya, is my greatest mm-hmm. encourager and my most faithful critic. Both things are true. If I, Sometimes she, she will say to me, she will, wow, oh, that was magnificent. She, you just glorified the Lord. I just love that. Other times she's silent. When, when yeah. she's silent, I can't take it. I'm like, <laughs> you, you got to say something. What, what yeah. about this morning? And her gracious yeah. comment is something like, well... You know, for anybody else, that would be great. But for you, I just know what you're capable of. Yeah. And what a lovely way of saying, yeah, that, that wasn't up to par. Uh, and it, like Diane, she, she is a great encourager. But, we, you know, we don't want our wives to be dishonest just to pat us on the back. I'm grateful for that kind of candor and encouragement. Yeah. Uh, do your sons preach like you? Yeah, I, uh, that's a good question because both uh, Daniel's a pastor and Patrick's a seminary professor, but he preaches quite a bit. I would say that Daniel's style, is a, because he, went, he was a Capitol Hill Baptist, mm-hmm. is a little closer to what a Mark Dever would do. Uh, he's under Michael Lawrence right now. Uh, whereas Patrick's style, yeah, I, th- I think Patrick's got a unique style. I think they're both good preachers, and they're growing yeah. and developing and preaching. I've said, uh, I mean, Patrick's a seminary professor, and I've said to him in the last couple of years, uh, because he's passionate when he preaches, I've said to him, have you ever thought that you should leave the seminary and be a preacher? But he doesn't feel led that way right now. Anyway. Not yet, anyway. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Have you mm-hmm. ever preached badly? I know, I, I trust that you always get the meaning of the text basically right. So I don't mean badly that you just blow the meaning. Mm. You just didn't deliver it well. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. I remember one sermon in terms of delivery. I kept saying, how, how was it? I think when I meant to say heaven, I kept saying hell. I, I was just off. You that's, know? A, that's like the spoonerism. You know? Yeah, people start laughing. Like, this is not going well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you think about delivery? Like, do you? Do you plan delivery? Do you think about, as you're preaching, do you think, oh, my voice is monotonous? I mean, how do you, how do you yeah, think about delivery? Yeah, I do. I, actually, you've helped me in that. I'll never forget when we went down to Brazil and the talks you gave to people. I thought that was such a – it reminded me when I was down there you, that all of us as preachers need refreshers because I thought I, – uh, you, you talked about that in those uh, uh, lectures you gave. Yeah. Now, were you listening in English or Portuguese? Y- you spoke in English. Oh, okay. <laughs> you were translated. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. I, yeah. Oh, absolutely, I remember. But, uh, yeah, I think that is a really helpful point. Not, and, and I think I tend to be in a lower vocal range to keep that in mind. Uh, I think as preachers, we all need those reminders. Absolutely. You know, energy – matters yeah. energy in the pulpit matters uh you wrote a book on spiritual gifts uh so what role do you think they play in preaching well i would argue as i said that those who preach have the spiritual gift of teaching and exhortation together so explanation of the text but then that application of the text and 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 i think explanation is really important but the greatest preachers I think are strong. Now, they got to be strong in teaching, but they're strong on exhortation. Right. You know, especially you know, you think of people. A lot of people in our churches, not all the people, but they know the Bible pretty well. We need to be. We need. We need it applied powerfully to our lives. And Ab- I think that spiritual absolutely. gift of exhortation uh, just uh, it 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 strikes us in the heart. 
Have you ever preached and you saw, like, you you felt a an unusually powerful moving of the Spirit? Have you ever had that? Happen? Yeah. I, I, I mean, not that I saw anything really physically, but I could sense in the room. I'm not thinking of any particular sermon, but I've, I've had that experience more than once where I, I sensed with myself and just what's happening in the room, the Lord's the Lord's working in an unusual way. It's a marvelous thing when it happens, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's such a testimony. It's 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 God. I mean, yeah, you're, it, you're, it because you're, I recognize, uh, I think we all feel this way as preachers. When I, I felt almost every time, like, wow, this is miserable. Uh, yeah. I, uh, or if I felt too good about it, it tended not to come off as well. It, it was so interesting. But there were so many times where I felt like in preparing, this is not good. Yeah. And and I felt again and again those sermons, maybe I'd pray more. I'd come out the other end and I'd say, Wow, the Lord really worked with what I thought was not a very good sermon. Yeah. So the Lord is good oh, that way, isn't oh. he? Uh here's my favorite question for you. I love asking you this. How many books have you written? You know, I, I haven't counted. I don't know. I don't I don't count things like that. I don't think it's healthy to count things like that. Well, you know, well, most people have I mean, even well, authors, you know, have enough fingers on one hand to count. Well, uh that's amazing. I just I just want well, to point out that God has gifted you to the church and you have been faithful with that gift and you produced so many incredible tools for preachers to use and seminary professors and students. And I just want to personally thank you. Do you remember what was the first book you wrote? Well, it's in a one volume commentary of the Bible. I wrote a little commentary on the gospel of Luke, but the first standalone book, Scott McKnight Mm -hmm. invited me to write the little book interpreting the Pauline epistles. Yeah. And and one thing I want to say is, honestly, when I went to do my PhD, and even when I finished my PhD, I did not have a great interest in writing. It just slowly came. Really? I, didn't, I did not anticipate that I would write. I you just know, thought I just wanted to teach. You know, the fascinating thing to me is that while you were pastoring, though, you you, you weren't preaching from the same things you like from the books you were writing books about right you were doing different preps yeah yeah that's astounding but i but i did tell them when i first met with them i said look i have one day a week to prepare basically so i'll do my best in that one day and meet with the elders and we were pretty small at the beginning and uh, you know there were other elders to help with other pastoral duties and the other thing is if you have a great wife we had many many people over to our house for dinner because yeah. Diane loves to host. So that was a great way to, you know, do ministry. Well, given hospitality something of a biblical uh, mandate. So hmm. you, I'm glad you, you did that. Um, uh, let, me, let me ask you a very important question. Last year, you and I went to New England together, and we preached through Hebrews. And we each preached from Hebrews 6. I got to go first. Oh. And I take a different view of the warning passage there than you. So here's my big question. Did I convince you you're wrong? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but you do hold the majority view among uh, people who think you can't lose your salvation. Yeah. I, yeah. My view is, I know my view is the minority view, but I stand by it. Yeah, but that, thou art not yeah. far from the kingdom. I'm saying, <laughs> you know, you're, not, you're not far. I mean, well, in the well. end, we sort of understand it the same way, but yeah. uh, get there a different path. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I've got some lightning round questions for you, just brief answers. Yeah. I'd like to hear uh, your answer to what two preachers have most shaped you? Uh, I would say John Piper. I was a member in John Piper's church for 11 years and then uh, Tim Keller. All right. What book should all preachers read? You know, the last book I read, but I thought it was great, was uh, Michael Horton, Calvin on the Christian Life. Uh, have you ever preached in open air or on a street corner? No, I haven't. Uh, all right, we gotta we got to hook you up. Uh, all right, Moeller is known for Brooks Brothers bow ties and fountain pens. I wear Kohans. What's your fashion statement? So I got, I'll tell you a little story really okay. quickly. In high school, you know when your kids are starting to 
observe you for the first time. It's so fascinating to watch. And my son, Daniel, our oldest son, said to me one day, Dad, there's two kinds of people. There are people who care about what clothes they wear, and there's people who don't. And then he said, and you don't. <laughs> well, that is a fashion That's statement. That's a fashion statement. Hey, when you're, oh. well, what did your daughter, Anna, as a little girl, ask me to do that she would not let you do? She asked you to pull out one of her teeth, and you did. That's right. She, mm. I, I pulled her tooth. Oh. Other than your own church, if you could preach in any pulpit in the world, where would it be? Uh, where Martin Lloyd-Jones preached, Westminster Chapel. Westminster Chapel. Mm. I have been there. I have not preached oh. there. But that is a great aspiration. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Tom Schreiner, for being with us on the Pastor Well podcast. And thank you for all of you who listened. If you've not yet subscribed, make sure you do so that you don't miss an episode. And we'll look forward to seeing you again on Pastor Well.